this is NDTV and you're watching Classics. Two eminent Indians with an umbilical connection have been very much in the limelight recently. Justice Leela Seth, the first woman judge of the Delhi High Court, the first woman chief justice of an Indian High Court. Indeed, the first woman ever to top the bar exam in London has just published her memoirs. It's called On Balance. And her son, poet and novelist Vikram Seth, who read from the book and introduced it. Thank you both very much for joining NDTV. It's a great pleasure to have uh, two people of double distinction here. Thank you. Thanks. Just to say it, uh, life in the law and life of judges and lawyers uh, is a pretty cagey life. They rarely go public. And you are one of the few people who've told us what really goes on inside chambers, inside judges' lunchrooms, inside bar association libraries. How did you decide to take the plunge in writing your book and tell all? Well, once I decided to write an autobiography, I thought there was no point in writing superficially. I thought, unless I'm honest and candid about what really goes on, uh, there's no real purpose. And I'm all the time talking about transparency. So I think that one should be as transparent as possible. There is a public often admonished and living in fear of contempt. Did you, did you think you were, you were going to slap with the contempt for telling all? If you'll notice that uh, it's been told in, uh, with judicial decorum, <laughs> let's put it like that. So that uh, though I have told many home truths, but I think I've said it within the uh, parameters of what is permissible to say. Many of these uh, people. Your yeah. grandmother, for yes. example, your maternal grandmother, mm. uh, and your mother's early years, mm. really are the source of material for your heroine and the early chapters of a suitable boy, aren't they? What do you think about that, Baba? Well, as far as my mother is concerned, she is Rupa Mera. There is no doubt about that. that. I, can so I think there is no difference between Rupa Mera and her. Almost. Almost starting from the handbag and the tears sort of suddenly welling up. The and waterworks. Yes, as we used to call it. So she's exactly as uh, it is in the suitable boy. But I don't think that I'm Lata. <laughs> True. I, obviously, a, a, a Lata leaves the book, exits the book when she's 21 or something like that, if memory serves. And uh, you've gone way beyond that. I also think she isn't uh, like my mother. Harish is more like my father, in a sense, than Lata is like my mother. Lata's a Composite. So is her age. I would have found it quite embarrassing, actually, in, to, to some extent, to attribute certain thoughts to my heroine Lata if I had continually thought of her as being my mother. Two writers in the family now. Yes, One, dangerous, isn't it? This combination. <laughs> One telling about a lived life, mm. the other telling a life excavated and imagined. Yeah, Both. That's true. Uh, the interesting thing about recent fiction by you mm. is that. A lot of it is based on family life, personal relationships, isn't it? Both A Suitable Boy and Equal Music and the book you're now writing. That's true. Um, actually, even my first novel, uh, um, The Golden Gate, um, I think takes its strength um, if, from, from the strength the characters get. Uh, it's sustained by family life. Even though they're isolated yuppies in a modern day city like San Francisco, um, the fact that uh, their families are either very strongly with them or uh, their uh, relationships are in the process of dissolving seems to be the thing that's uppermost in their minds. Uh, the other thing, though, is that I, I do think that I put a lot of emphasis on work in my novels. Mm -hmm. um, after all, family life is one part of our lives. Uh, love and passion and romance is one part of our lives. But actually, we spend a heck of a lot of time working. And uh, that's what adds interest and savor to our lives as well. Among the many uh, loving and very frank portraits that you draw of all your children are portraits of Vikram. Uh, and you remember him as uh, reserved, shy, academically brilliant, uh, a complex boy. A little obstinate. He was one track, let's put it like that. If he wanted a gramophone, he wanted a gramophone. Then everything in the house became a gramophone. 
to the extent even the soles of his shoes became gramophones. And eventually we were so exhausted with his one-tracked mind that we just went out and bought him a gramophone. So he was always like that, I think. Whenever he want, wants to do something or wants something, he just goes for it. But of course, he was also very affectionate and loving and uh, intelligent, very sensitive. We had, he had a tadpole. When the tadpole died, there was a big crisis in the house. You know? We had to make a whole ceremony of what death was about, how the tadpole had to be buried. Sadly, I remember none of this. Yeah. Being the first child, I think one's parents tend to be rather unrelaxed about bringing up the child, uh, afraid of putting a foot wrong and um, of spoiling the child, perhaps. So I think I got the brunt of the discipline. Yeah, I think uh, the, the most experimentation was done on you. Probably so. Whether it was to discipline you, whether it was to sort of teach you, or whether it was to lock you up in a cupboard even once, which I was know. a horrible thing now looking well, back you know, on it, so. how I ever did such a thing. But I did, you know. Yeah. But he was so stubborn, you know. I remember walking down the road in, in London, and he wanted something, and I wasn't giving it to him. And he just sat on the road and cried and cried. And I thought maybe, maybe the uh, Society for Prevention of Cruelty to Children was going to <laughs> arrest me any moment. And so I didn't know dragging him away. But he was quite a little Well, you know, you spend terror. all of these stories like this, Mama, and I'll, 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 I might even sue you. Oh. <laughs> <laughs>